Um, before we go into all of those, yeah, I think talking a little bit about the history, I think would be really fascinating. Uh, you think you've been in it longer than most people. Um, what, how, what led you to cover the Kickstarter at first? Well, yeah, I, I'd heard about it at, at, coming out of E3, and so I'd heard a lot of buzz. Um, and basically, they were, I knew Palmer, Lucky was from Long Beach, and that was right outside of like our coverage area. It was right at the edge of where we would cover where, things. So this is Orange County. We, what were we writing for? Uh, it's uh, the Orange County Register, based in Santa Ana or Irvine, California. And uh, I was a technology reporter uh, for the, the organization. And I had heard about the Kickstarter and uh, was obviously pretty interested and excited about it. But I saw that it was just kind of like at the edge of the coverage area. So Los, uh, Long Beach is in Los Angeles County. Orange County is right across the border. And then I heard mm -hmm. uh, that I heard a couple of things that they were getting office space in Orange County. And then I heard Brendan was coming on as CEO. And uh, Brendan was from Gaikai, which was another Orange County startup that got purchased by Sony to do their uh, PlayStation Now streaming. So uh, he was leaving one Orange County company and basically setting up office space with another Orange County company. So I got a really so good like excuse a to game. go out there. Yeah, I, I had a good excuse to go <laughs> out there. And I remember going out there and doing a couple stories. I did a, a very good story that first time. Um, and I called two people uh, after my initial demo uh, and an interview. I called uh, Jeremy Balenson at Stanford Wow. And I called Mark Bolas at USC, and I wanted to know, okay, is this legit? Uh, are they actually going to produce good VR? Uh, is it good enough and consumer ready? And then, um, yeah, so I, I called Balance, and I remember him breaking down the basics of VR at the time. Um, he basically hmm. said, VR is three things, tracking, rendering, and display. And right now we have that in our homes with things like the... Prime Sense uh, Connect, and that basically mm -hmm. tracks, and then the the display render or the you know the machine renders, and then the TV displays, and so we've got these pieces for virtual reality in our homes right now. We just need to make it everything you see, and that's uh, essentially VR. Um, and he, he he broke it down so well for me in that story, and then Bolas basically explained to me, yeah. Um, this, it seems like they've got a really good recipe because he had just uh, he had done the FOV to go project, which was the cardboard based system. Um, and uh, funny funny story side side note: if I had I had actually gotten a call the summer before from USC's PR representative saying there's a an, a local VR headset at your at a local conference and you should come out and see it, and it's basically just putting your phone in a cardboard headset. And I remember telling the PR person at the time, "No, I'm too busy. Uh, I can't. I can't go see that." But if I had gone to go see that that person in that headset, it would have seen Palmer Lucky uh, a year before everyone else. And I, I said no. Oh, interesting. So that that was Palmer's project at, <clears throat> at USC. He was working on it, I believe. I don't remember how much of it was his. Right. Wow, that's that's a fascinating history. Actually, I, I didn't realize there was um, the phone based cardboard you know, prototypes even before Google was pushing that. Oh, yeah. In fact, um, it's actually very funny. One of the first devices was Durovis Dive that was surprisingly, I think, 100 kilometers away from where I'm living right now in Germany, founded by some marketing agency, and they created this open source uh, hardware. And then later, the guy who did the project at this agency, I don't remember the name right now, actually went to Google, and I think this is how the cardboard project got hmm. kickstarted. So I actually mm. bought the Derovis dive before the cardboard existed and showed it to my professor. That's how we convinced him to do VR science. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. Um, and Ian, I mean, in terms of knowing Balance and, and, and uh, I mean, was, was VR something that you were really interested in from like a research perspective or like why were you even following up on, I had, on this? I had been vaguely aware of like the, it wasn't Viewmaster, but I can't, I can't remember the company that built an early uh, phone-based VR headset. There was some toy uh, hmm. that was like years ahead of everything else. Um, what and year are you kind of thinking about? I'm thinking it. I think I found an app on the app store that was from that period, but it was maybe 2011. Um, or before, hmm. uh, where I, I yeah, I, I, I want to say there was an early toy. And so it, it didn't seem uh, 
the concept of using her phone for VR at the time didn't kind of blow me away. I, I, it was something you could do, but it wasn't very good quality. And then you had these Oculus folks come out, coming along and showing how they were going to do something that was PC powered, but using the economics of a phone uh, system and using that to kind of mainstream VR. You could, you could see the pieces like they, they weren't, they weren't saying phone VR is good enough. They were saying uh, phone VR is a starting point. We're going to do something much better than that. And you could see how if they just improved tracking a little bit, rendering a little bit and display a little bit, they would have something pretty compelling. Um, and so I kind of got hooked mm -hmm. and I kept coming back to my editors uh, with more stories. Like I wanted to do what's Palmer's background story. I wanted to do all these different stories. <laughs> and uh, the uh, I remember the editors hadn't had the demos. I couldn't get them to go over, you know, take the time out of their day to go over to Oculus headquarters and put the headset on. I finally get one. I finally got one of my editors to do it, and um, it was a little bit easier to get my stories done after that about VR. But I, I remember one of the editors kind of telling me, uh, or telling my other editor, uh, kind of lay off the VR stories for now. Um, <laughs> I remember getting a call while I was uh, driving from the the editor that saw VR and said, "Have you heard the latest? They just got acquired by Facebook." And I remember. I had that feeling in my stomach that a lot of people, I think, that day did. Um, so I don't know. Um, it's kind of like this, it, it's this moment of realization, it's going to happen. Uh, and Facebook uh, is going to be the company to do it. And I, like many people, uh, had sort of that big brother fear in my heart. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that the future was safe. And um, I think the moment that that happened, you knew number one, VR was going to happen uh, on a massive scale. But number two, uh, we need to be careful. Mm. Yeah, that's, I think that's a, those are strong kind of uh, themes that have stayed relevant throughout that time, right? It's like, it's going to happen, but let's proceed with caution and, and keep an eye out on the you know, potential dangers that can arise from it. But I mean, obviously like really enamored by like the technology itself and, and what it can enable. It's, it's, um, it's awesome. It's scary. I mean, I, 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 even from that time, I remember I, then I read Balenson's book uh, over the next two years uh, that he did with Jim Blaskovich. I think uh, he's, I think he's in, at, infinite. Uh, yeah. Infinite reality, infinite realities, right? Yeah. I think the other guy was, it's, um, uh, what is it? Uh, Santa Barbara. I think he's at Santa Barbara College. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what's um, maybe last question for me before we go to the news? Um, how do you see, uh, with a lot of insights you have right now, and also you know your history of covering everything, um, where the wave of VR, or XR, however you call it, right? Well, where where are we heading right now? Because um, different companies like Facebook is you now putting a lot of pressure on the mobile and they want to have mobile devices. Vive releases a more desktop, a powerful device, whatever. Where, where, where do you see this whole movement going? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot, of, lot to answer there. Um, standalone has been the thing on the, on the future uh, roadmaps since the beginning. And I don't think anyone outside of Facebook or HTC or Microsoft have, have experienced what it's like to invite a standalone system into your home. Um, I, I, remember asking at, I remember asking Facebook at Oculus Connect 4, would you call Oculus Go a communications device? And they were just, they weren't, weren't answering anything at the time. The only thing that they would say at the time was that Oculus Go would be compatible with all the Gear VR uh, content and if it is compatible with all the Gear VR content, you can assume that there's a microphone on board, um, because mm. some apps use the microphone for certain things. Uh, and I, I think what happens is you've got a headset sitting there that can ring uh, with a VR call, and I'm hoping mm. that that feature is there. I, I, I think it needs to be there in order for it to be a successful device. But when my VR headset is sitting on the table and it rings and I put the headset on and I'm talking to you and I'm talking to you, that's a transformative moment in technology. And I don't think anyone has experienced it broadly yet. 
I think you tweeted about this in terms of like that this existed in a form with alt space uh, when that calling for the Gear VR, right? Yeah, and st- and you can stick your phone into the headset and then hope that the app launches because you press the link right before you you clicked the phone into the headset. It just it was clunky, uh, really really clunky to do that whole process to get into VR and even putting your Rift on. I mean, I was five minutes late to our recording session because uh, I needed to go run and get my Oculus Touch hand controllers. Um, it's, it's one extra thing to get you into VR uh, and then the two sensors and you know the whole thing. It's just every single time you want to meet up with someone, there's a giant process involved. And it could, that process can be anywhere from three minutes to an hour and a half of troubleshooting. And, and you don't want to meet in VR after you've been troubleshooting for an hour and a half. Right. Um, but, I mean, the, but the payoff of meeting in VR is huge. I mean, uh, the more we meet in big screens, the more I realize I also started to sometimes meet people that I met from around the world and we can't see each other because they're far and away. Actually, you know, try to meet with them in VR because it kind of adds a certain personal touch to it. It's a wonderful thing. If the hustle wouldn't be that big, like the payoff is huge. Like the next step after phone, like the virtual presence. But yeah, I I, yeah, I, I I can't wait for the VR call. Like you, when you call me on my headset and it's ready to go instantly, I will pick up that call uh, nine times out of ten probably. Um, mm-hmm. I, I suppose that I, it would be nice to know who's calling me uh, before I put the headset on. I <laughs> I don't know how they're going to solve no. that. It's a surprise. <laughs> 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 it's like it's going back to original <laughs> telephones, right? You're like, I don't know who the hell this is. Let's pick it up. It could be, it could be the president. It could be my ex girlfriend. You know, <laughs> actually, yeah. I mean, the old phones did have a screen, and people still laughed it, so it's fine. Yeah, I mean, it was a crapshoot. It's like I don't know. It could be the most important <laughs> phone call of my life, or it could be the freaking worst. 